I sure am tired doing all these video lectures for my little nerdlings. So I went to the store and I bought this energy drink. But I'm not really sure if it has energy in it. Let's find out. Welcome back, nerdlings. So today we're going to be discussing the first part of energy, enzymes, and metabolism. Energy is defined as the capacity to do work, the capacity to cause change. All living things must obtain energy from the environment. Cells can't create energy, so we have to find a way to do that. Plants obtain their energy through the process of photosynthesis, which uses the light from the sun in a reaction to produce glucose and energy. Animals obtain energy when they eat plants or other animals. And humans, for example, need energy to grow, to think, and to move. So we have different forms of energy. Energy can come in the chemical form, a light form, mechanical form, heat form, or electrical form. Energy can also not be created nor destroyed, but it can be transformed from one form to another. So we have two types of energy. We have kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, moving around, and then we have potential energy, which is stored energy. So if you look right here, this diagram might look very simple, and it might be something you've seen in the eighth grade when you were talking about different types of energy. We have kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. So when the sky is biking up the hill, that's kinetic energy. At the top, at the very most top point, this is potential energy. He is at the very top, and as he rolls down, that's going to be energy of motion again, and it's kinetic energy. So here are some examples of the different types of energy forms. Right here, we have a raised brick. It's going to smack the ground, it's kinetic energy as it's falling, and when it smacks the ground, it actually releases a little bit of heat. So if you slap your hand on a desk really hard, it's actually going to be a little bit hot. We have chemical energy that's stored in a battery. It starts to power the fan and it's converted into electrical energy. Eventually, the fan's going to start to move and that's going to be kinetic energy or the energy of movement, motion. Here's another type of chemical energy. Chemical energy can be stored in the bonds of molecules and released as heat energy. We also have energy from the sun that excites chlorophyll molecules and it gets released in the chemical bond. So what type of chemical reactions occur? We have the breaking and the forming of bonds, and we have chemical reactions that either release or take up energy. We have endothermic reactions. These take up or absorb energy. They're also called endergonic reactions. I like to think of inside, all right? An example of that is photosynthesis. So an endergonic reaction is cold to the touch. So if you pick up a cold soda can, it's cold to the touch. So different reactions that are considered to be endergonic are going to be cold to the touch. Heat is not released, it's conserved. The second type of reaction that we have are exothermic reactions. These are also called exergonic. I like to think of it as an explosion. So exothermic or exergonic and it's explosion. It releases heat. An example of this is cellular respiration. It releases energy. Metabolism, if you guys paid attention in our digestion lecture, is a term used to describe all of the chemical processes and reactions that occur in an organism. The reaction pathway can be anabolic or it could be catabolic. Anabolic means that it consumes energy to build complex molecules. So, if you remember for our lecture in class, if we're going to make molecules, we have two molecules here. An anabolic reaction would be when we combine those two molecules together with the help of an enzyme. So we add molecules together through the process of dehydration synthesis. And the enzyme is what's actually catalyzing that reaction of dehydration synthesis. 
And since it's adding those two substrates together, it's called anabolic, anaads. Now catabolic reactions release energy by breaking down complex molecules. So we break molecules apart by adding water. So we added water through the process of... If you said hydrolysis, you're correct. Hydro meaning water and lysis meaning to split apart. So the enzyme also catalyzes that reaction. It will take that substrate in, it will add water to it, and then it will split apart. And that's a catabolic reaction. Remember, cats <laughs> scratch things apart. Anna adds. Catabolic reactions, cats <laughs> scratch things apart. So the two types of metabolism. If you look over here, we have a, many things linked together, polymer. So if we wanted to break that polymer down through the process of hydrolysis, meaning we add water, it's considered a catabolic reaction. We are scratching through and breaking all of those bonds. So now we underwent a catabolic reaction, and we call this catabolism. And that is just a fancy word for an enzymatic hydrolysis reaction. Now if we wanted to take all of these molecules and add them back together, we would do that through the process of dehydration synthesis. So we take water out, and it's going to bond all of those molecules back together. And we call that anabolism. Anna adds, and cats scratch. So where does all of this energy come from? It comes from a tiny little molecule called ATP. So ATP is made out of an adenine, which is a nitrogenous base. It's made out of a five carbon sugar called ribose, and it also has a phosphate group. It's called adenosine triphosphate. Tri means three, so it has a chain of three phosphates. So as you see here, here are three phosphates. Now if this looks like a nucleotide base, then you're right. The only way you can tell the difference between this being part of a nucleotide base and it not being is that there are three phosphates on adenosine triphosphate. It has three. On a normal nucleotide base, it's only going to have one phosphate instead of three. All living things rely on ATP for the capture and the transfer of free energy needed to do work and maintain cells. ATP is kind of like energy currency. So again, adenosine triphosphate is made out of three phosphates, two with high energy bonds, and the last phosphate group contains the most energy. So if you look at the little animation here, we have energy used for an energonic reaction when this phosphate is released. So high energy bond, we have the addition of water causing hydrolysis, then the phosphate splits off by itself. So breaking bonds of ATP. We also need to add phosphates on. The process of adding phosphates is called phosphorylation, meaning we're going to add a phosphate on. This occurs continuously in cells. An enzyme called ATPase can weaken and break down that last phosphate bond, releasing energy and free phosphates. So right here, we have our phosphate coming off. And eventually, it will be rephosphorylated and a phosphate will be added back on. <clears throat> so how much energy do ATP, or how much ATP do cells use? It's estimated that each cell will generate and consume approximately 10 million molecules of ATP per second. That's a lot of energy. So just like a battery, our ATP is charged when it's phosphorylated, and then it gets uncharged when that high phosphate bond is broken. So eventually, we need to recharge our bodies. So that's why I was thinking, maybe I needed an energy drink to recharge me, but 
I don't really know if this has ATP. So stay tuned for part two of our lecture of energy, enzymes, and metabolism.